Hi. Hi. I think you missed all the quest. I'm here. Oh, sorry. I was like looking at all the comments. How are you doing? Great. I'm good, thank you. Doing well. Nice. Yes. Hi. Um, so for those of you that are just tuning in, my name is Brittany Sierra, and I am the founder of the Sustainable Fashion Forum. And today I'm super excited to be chatting with Carrie, who is the co-founder of Fashion Revolution. She is also the global operations director. And we are going to be chatting about um, Black Friday and the impacts of overconsumption. We're also going to be talking about something that is really, really interesting to me which is the impact of uh, fashion marketing and also like how that plays into overconsumption. So Carrie if you want to just introduce yourself, introduce Fashion Revolution, maybe um, chat a little bit about how you got into sustainability and how Fashion Revolution came about and just sort of share that story with us. Of course yes well I'm the founder and the global operations director of Fashion Revolution and I guess my sustainability journey started a really long time ago, back in 1992, when what was supposed to be a project in the summer holidays before my PhD started turned into, into a career in the fashion industry with my fair-made Panama hat brand, Patrick Uti, mm. and specialised in, in Panama hats, which were made with women's communities in the Andean region of of. Um, Ecuador and we really went on a, a, a transparency and traceability journey so as well as becoming the first organization in the world to be fair trade certified wow. we were a pilot for something called the geo fair trade project and we traced our Panama hats right back to the GPS coordinates of the weavers houses and wow. back to where the raw material the sort of GPS coordinates of the plots of land where the raw material grew so I guess when the Rana Plaza factory collapsed in Bangladesh, I knew straight away that it was that lack of transparency which had cost lives when we saw people searching through the rubbles, the rubble to find those labels. I knew that we had to start to put things back together again and, and show people that transparency journey because at the time nobody was talking about transparency and I've been banging on about it for so many years. But <laughs> you know, now for Definitely, transparency is a word on everybody's lips. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's really, it's really inspiring. Um, so today we're going to be chatting about Black Friday and sort of the and the campaign that you all have put together surrounding Black Friday. I know as at SFF, we're super proud to be um, supporters of this. But if, can you tell the folks that are watching um, what the campaign is and and what it entails and why why you started it? course I mean Black Friday is part of the sort of I guess the wider fashion revolution campaign which we run all year round we we have our sort of fashion revolution week in, in April but we also campaign all year round for for, for dignity and rights and um, sort of better environmental and social standards within in the fashion industry and I think when we look at Black Friday it's really important we actually look at the interconnectedness of the social and the environmental, because we often think about the impact in terms of, of the environment. We look at the, 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 the huge amount of stuff that we're buying and all the packaging and transport it comes with. But I think it's also really important to look at the, the social issues as well and the, the pressure, you know, the pressure all this production puts on, on workers who are working for, for, you know, very rarely a living wage within the industry and mm -hmm. the in terms of, of overtime as well but I think what's important is that when we when we buy into these these deals which often seem like they're good deals we're sending a message to the brands that it's it's kind of okay for them to carry on seemingly um, to, uh, overproducing because it's it's it sort of sends a message that it's okay for them to do this because we'll buy into to all of that stuff that they produce as long as it's heavily discounted at the end of the day so this is what we really need to address. It's the hyper discount culture. And that's why we're asking people to really take a stand against the, the brands from Black Friday all the way through to, to Cyber Monday. I mean, if you're, you are buying as a question of affordability, then you aren't going to get any, any guilt from us. I think that's really important to say. 
But when we look at the statistics, I mean, around a third of the shoppers in the UK were buying clothing and shoes. That was, that was their purchases over the Black Friday weekend. And in countries like France, I mean, that was more than 50% of their purchases for clothing and shoes. And we have to look at whether that is a, a frivolous buy rather than something that comes out of out of necessity. So if you do buy new clothes this weekend, you know, make sure that it's something which you're actually going to love and which you're going to keep in your wardrobe for years to come. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really important when we talk about Black Friday and also just in sustainability in general, that we take into account that there are different levels and layers to the conversation. And not everyone's situation is the same, you know? So some people are buying during Black Friday because this is the time that they actually can afford to make these purchases. This is the time that they can, you know, get the things that they've been looking at all year long because they couldn't afford it, you know, in previous months or previous times. And I think it's important that we talk about Black Friday and, and we're campaigning and we're, and we're sort of asking folks to take a stand to understand that there are some people who are truly buying out of necessity, but it's the folks that are sort of buying because they can, you know, just buying because things are cheap and things are, you know, less expensive that we're really wanting to connect with and really wanting them to um, to maybe think differently about their purchases. And I think also another part of the conversation is to understand that it's not about the price point, you know, it's not about the fact that a dress is $15. And even when we talk about fast fashion, like, it's not the fact that the that the dress is inexpensive, you know, like, I love a good discount. Like, I I am not made of money. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I am, you know, I can't afford a lot of the brands that I talk about. Um, so it's not the actual price point of the garment or the item that you're purchasing or that you're wanting to buy. It's everything behind it. It's why it is that price, you know. Um, if, a, if a brand is charging a very small amount for something, you know, their chances are they're not paying a live-in wage. Chances are they're not using the best materials possible. And I think that, you know, that is the issue. It's not the price point. So I, I wanted to say that because I, I get that a lot and get a lot of DMs about that. It's not the fact that something is $10, $20, you know, whatnot. It's the reason why, you know, and why it's that price and sort of everything that kind of goes into that. Um, so I was wondering if you can talk to us about the impacts of fast fashion. I know that, or excuse me, Black Friday. Um, I know that there's, you know, some, uh, uh, like the disposability of like the plastic and whatnot. So can you talk about, um, sort of the implications of Black Friday? And then also for everyone that's watching, if you have a question, um, please put it in the question box down below. That way at the end, we can get to your questions and I don't have to like scroll through all the <laughs> comments to get there. Um, so yeah, so Kara, if you could share with us sort of like the impact of Black Friday and how it affects people and planet, that'd be awesome. Yes, gosh, that's quite quite a lot to roll up into one question. But yeah, I, I know. <laughs> the point there, but I think we could be talking about, you know, it is, I mean, the, the story of Black Friday is, is the story of the fashion industry. And, you know, as you've already touched on, barely anybody in the fashion industry receives a living a living wage. So there's, there's a lot to unpack there. But I think one thing that we will see this Black Friday is we will see a lot of retailers highlighting their green credentials they'll be you know they'll be trying to highlight their sustainability claims amidst what's you know really a growing global sense of, of unease about this annual spending spree i think this year more than any other year in the past i mean companies know that plastic is bad we can't get away from that so you're going to see a lot of them putting some kind of a, a gloss on their messaging they'll be talking about recycled packaging or recyclable packaging or maybe some sort of vague future commitment towards their plastic and packaging goals um, at some time in the future. So I think it's really important we actually unpick this and look at, you know, what are their goals? Are they disclosing long term or ideally short term goals to, to sort of to to transition out of out of plastic particularly in their their packaging and are they disclosing annual in, in annual progress towards those goals so i think that's really important to look at and actually when we look at the the fashion transparency index which is our sort of annual assessment of what the 250 biggest brands in the world disclose in terms of their their policies their procedures and their impact we found that only 29% of brands were disclosing 
any measurable progress at all towards reducing the use of virgin plastics. And I think considering mm. an incredibly important issue, this is not just for the fashion industry, but for the whole planet, it's really important that we actually push brands to do a lot more to, to address the use of virgin plastics in our clothing and, and in our packaging as well. I think another thing it's really important to look at when we do look at the environmental impact, because a lot of the time we talk about the transport and the cost of returns, which is an issue. But actually, some of the surveys I, I've read, some of the reports have said that actually the highest impact is when you order next day delivery. That's what mm. really increases, increases the carbon impact, because it often means, particularly if you're in a rural area like, like I am here, that they will have to send a van out especially for that journey. Whereas if mm. you pick the five-day delivery option, then they will be able to tie that in on a normal delivery route. So if you are buying anything, don't select next day delivery, even if you didn't see whatever prime options to do. So I think that's a really important way to, to help to minimise your impact. Yeah. So you were talking about um, sort of like plastic packaging and all of that, you know, during this time. Do you think that... I think that I think that the statistic is uh, sixty percent, more than sixty percent of our clothing is made with polyester. Um, do you think that the average consumer, average shopper, knows that our clothes is made out of plastic? Essentially, <laughs> do you think that they know that? To, to be honest, I don't. I think if you asked other people, they would say, "Well, of course, everybody knows that." But I think there's. I often say to my team, who a lot of them are London-based, and I think there's this real danger of, of being in a sort of bit of a sustainable ecosystem bubble and yeah. thinking that people invest further than they have. Whereas I live in rural Staffordshire, and I know that a lot of my friends don't know don't know about it. In fact, I talked to some people. Um, I talked to a friend I'm last year. And she had no idea that polyester was plastic and then came up very proudly the next week where she'd seen an article about how our Christmas jumpers are all made from plastic, saying, I would never have known this unless you talked to me about it. And she's probably in her 70s. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to realise that actually there's people of all generations who have absolutely no idea what, what's in our clothes and what polyester, acrylic, um, and a lot of these, these fibres are made from. And... I think a lot of the time, even when they do realise, they just think it's somebody else's problem to deal with. They don't want to change their habits. And one of the things I've thought for several years is that some of these, these issues, you know, which are so close to our hearts around human rights and the environment, they're just not going to get through to a lot of people who, who either don't care or don't have the time or the inclination to do something about it. But when they will start to take notice, I think it's when it starts to affect them and their families, yeah. their health and their bodies. And this really came home to me earlier this year. I'm not sure if you, you know, but I went on a really amazing sailing voyage. I'm um, mm. so fortunate to be able to do it before the pandemic shut it, shut it down. It was yeah. XX, which is part or was part, sadly cancelled now, of an all women round the world sailing voyage to investigate yeah. my plastic pollution and chemicals in the oceans. And I sailed 2,000 miles from the Galapagos to Easter Island, wow. some of the remote parts of the South Pacific. And every day we were dropping our manta trawls and our niskin bottles and bringing up the, the water, sifting it and doing the analysis of the microfibers and the plastics we found. And, you know, it, it was really shocking. It really brought it home to me that even in the remotest parts of, of our ocean, nearest, near to the remotest inhabited island in the world, every trawl we put in, we would bring up more and more and more plastic. And this plastic has chemicals in it and on it, and we're drinking these yeah. chemicals. Every time we have a glass of water, we have chemicals and microfibers. And I think people... People really don't realise. Um, Emily Penn, the co-founder of X Expedition, has her blood tested for 35 chemicals which are banned by the United Nations, and they found 29 of them in her bloodstream, wow. including pesticides, flame retardants. It's really shocking. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's that's incredible. That sounds like a really awesome opportunity. Oh, it, it really was. I'm, I'm so fortunate, so fortunate to be 
able to go. I'm like, I came back in the middle of March. So I'm literally the week of so the weeks that the world locked down. Right. So we were oblivious in, in, you know, glorious isolation in the middle of the Pacific on a boat. Right. Oh my gosh. And you came back to everything being closed and sort of craziness. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, for, for, the, for those of you that don't know, my background is actually in PR and marketing. So um, the way that the Sustainable Fashion Forum actually started was I was helping retailers, designers, and small brands here in Portland with their marketing as far as like their digital marketing, email marketing, social media marketing, all of that. It's like, my love and it's something that I really really enjoy um, and so this question is really interesting to me because you know it's, it's my background um, but it's talking about the role of fashion marketing in overconsumption and sort of like this push for Black Friday and you know basically like our brands being irresponsible in their marketing you know year round but especially during this time when they're really like pushing buy 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 and you know I think that you know, the obvious answer is yes, you know, um, I think it's really, it's like that whole thing between purpose and, and profit, right? And a lot of brands pick profit, you know, over their purpose or over doing things that may be better for the environment, better for people. Um, and, and so, of course, like, you know, if you're a marketer, and you're working for a company, and, and they have like a sale coming up or something like that, like your responsibility you know, if you want to keep your job <laughs> is to push that marketing is to push people to buy things. Um, but it is a very interesting idea of, you know, what it would look like if marketers or if companies and if brands were to uh, dial back on that push for buying things. I mean, certainly people would still purchase, right? Like certainly people still need to buy clothes, still need to buy things. Um, but it's an interesting conversation or idea to think about like, you know, potentially like marketing less or, or not necessarily marketing less, but maybe changing that message behind the marketing um, of, of what you're actually promoting. And I think that there are some really awesome brands out there now that are promoting, you know, buy our things, but buy it once, buy it so that, you know, buy it when you need to, and then purchase less after that. And they're still around, you know, and they're still making money. They still are, are going, maybe they're not making, you know, tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of money, but they're around and they're still here. So I think it's a matter of, you know, that greed and sort of putting purpose before profit, of course, right? And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's an interesting conversation. Do you like have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it is. And I was wondering whether you think that most brands really, really are irresponsible when they market consumption to the point of environmental degradation. I mean, do, do you feel that most brands that, that they are, they are greenwashing their credentials? I definitely think that there's a lot of greenwashing going on. I think that, you know, as a marketer, it's really easy to make something look good. You know, it's really easy to make something look like it's this shiny solution when the reality is it's not. And I, I can think of like a couple brands, one in particular right now, who I think that they are doing, honestly, they're doing some really amazing things as far as sustainability and their initiatives, but they're really focusing on these initiatives that they're doing, these collections that they're coming out with, but they're not addressing the fact that they're producing thousands and thousands and thousands of products and potentially the people that are making them are not being paid, you know, a living wage where they can take care of their families, but they're focusing on, you know, this shiny new collection or this new development that they that they have. And yeah, I, I definitely think that there's some irresponsible, you know, but irresponsible. And I think that there's a lot of greenwashing going on there. And um, yeah, I think that, you know, also the conversation and, and like marketing there's so there's so much to it like just with sustainability and how layered it is with marketing it's extremely layered as well because you're essentially like making people feel as though they need this product in order to feel better about themselves in order to look better in order to feel accepted because everyone is wearing this and so you need to feel like you need to wear it too um you know the whole the fashion faux pas of like wearing something you know over like if you guys have watched I think the other live that I did, I literally wore the same outfit, you know, and that would be with the fashion faux pas of like, oh, I'm being seen again in the same turtleneck and the same hat. But I mean, to me, I think that the cool part is if you can like rewear something and make it look fresh, make it look new rather than always having to have something new. I think it'd be really interesting for a marketing standpoint if we could promote like true style is being able to rock the same thing many different ways and have it look different every time or have it look amazing every single time rather than, you know, I have to have something new. Like if that's the case, then maybe you don't truly have style because 
if you have to have something new in order to have like a good look, maybe you don't really know how to put your outfits together because if you did, you could rock the same thing in your closet and put it together in all these different yeah. ways and you would be totally stylish. So I think that it's it's so layered, you know, as with everything with sustainability, uh, it's, it's super, super layered. Um, but I'm curious to know when, so we're talking about Black Friday, we're saying, you know, if you're buying out of necessity, if this is like the time of year that you can afford to purchase these things, we're, this conversation isn't about you. But if you're, you know, buying just to buy because something's on sale and you're like, oh, that's kind of cute, but it's like really cheap. So I'm going to buy it anyways and maybe return it. Like after I post on Instagram, then this conversation is about you. Um, but for people who, um, like, what are some alternatives to, to shopping Black Friday? Like, I know there's a lot of people who they're new to the sustainability conversation. And so the idea of not shopping, especially during a time like this, when there's so many marketing messages, is challenging for them because they're seeing so many cute things. They're seeing these price tags and they're like, okay, I know that for planet and people, I shouldn't be buying this, but that is like a really cute dress. Like, so what, it, what should people do um, to sort of like avoid Black Friday? And what are some alternatives to buying new clothes um, and refreshing their closet? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's quite a lot we can do. When you were talking then, I was just flashing back to uh, when, when my daughter Sienna was still living at home with me and with my brand Patrick Cooter, we'd often go to London, Paris Fashion Weeks to, to sell our mm. Panama. And I certainly couldn't afford to buy, to buy many new clothes at all. And one thing we would do is when we got the sort of, you know, the new seasons collections in the fashion magazine, we'd sit down and look at the magazine, go through what's in our wardrobe, and look at how we could combine things differently. What do we have in our wardrobe that tied into the new season's trends? And how could we put things together differently? So if colour blocking was in, well, what things could we put together mm -hmm. in unexpected combinations? And I think that's such a valuable use of, of our time. There's so many things which I have given away to charity shops. And then I kick myself thinking, gosh, I really would have worn that this season. So I think, I mean, certainly when I... When I do have to buy new clothing, I go to some of those really great fashion resale sites. So Vestiaire would be the, the one in the, the UK, Europe, and I believe they're probably in the, I'm sure they're in the, in the US now. And you've got some other really great, great resale stores. Um, and, you know, places like New York, this time last year, I was in New York and I bought a gorgeous Alexander McQueen dress Ooh. in, in resale stores which somebody had fortunately just dropped off the day before and then that dress at the moment has gone to a friend so she's oh. borrowed it I've borrowed her lovely clip on I think they're Christiane Lacroix earrings so wow. friends if you've got somebody who's the same size do some clothing swaps I do it with my daughter all the time and I'll sort of gently remind her mm, can I have my Pringle skirt back when you come back again <laughs> it's a good way to actually sort of almost you forget what's in your wardrobe and it's like oh yes I can get that back again it's like you've got something something new again so certainly recommend that of course you know buying buying locally buying small it's so important to buy to buy locally if you spend a pound in your local community I think it's around 63 pence stays within the local economy Whereas if you buy with a, a bigger a bigger company, only around 40 pence will stay in the local economy. So really important to pick those small brands and retailers locally. Um, I, I often order a lot, particularly when I'm in Mexico. I'll work with some of the sort of smaller designers there. And I'll get a piece of clothing made in my colours and my size. And often mm. it takes months, nine months to arrive. And I love that because it makes me realise just how long that piece of clothing really takes to make because it's hand embroidered and it's got some lace work and it's got some sort of smocking or something like that um, and I love vintage as well I mean this is a lovely sort of Mexican gorgeous wheat peel so nice. um, yeah, those would be my my recommendations and also use the time you know we all have incredible power as, as citizens as consumers so use this time to be an activist and if you go to Fashion Revolution's website there's a Black Friday link there and you can follow it and then there's a, a section which you'll see an option which says stand up to the brand and there's a template which says something like sort of hey fashion brand this Black Friday I want to know that you're taking responsibility for the waste in your operations and that you're ensuring the well-being of everybody who makes our clothes 
So can you tell me what's in my clothes, who made my clothes, and what you're doing to address overproduction in the fashion supply chains? So that's a really easy thing to do. Send it as a DM or a tweet to the brand um, or, or drop them an email. So I think all of us can, can use our voice and our power. And brands really do listen to their customers. They might not listen as much to things like petitions, but they do listen to the voice of their customers. And I was once told that every message from a customer is taken as representing 10,000 people who mm. think the same can't be bothered to do anything about it. So, yeah, let's just use this next weekend to, to, to use our voice as customers and push for change. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. And I think also, you know, we're talking about Black Friday and sustainability and sustainable brands. Like, in order for us to move the needle on sustainability, right? There have to be brands for us to shop. You know, like we need, we do have to have clothes and we can't walk around naked. So there have to be brands for us to be able to shop. And I think that, you know, perhaps a counter to Black Friday could be to support sustainable brands, support local brands, as you mentioned, um, and support what we want to see be the future. So rather than shopping some of these other brands that have these massive discounted, you know, things going on right now, shopping the brands that we want to see continue on. Because the reality is, you know, being a small brand is extremely challenging, you know, like, producing clothing is extremely expensive. And especially right now during COVID, so many brands are taking a hit, so many brands are struggling. And I think that, you know, if we're going to talk about it, or if there are folks who, you know, would like to purchase during this time, perhaps shopping, you know, small and local, perhaps shopping sustainably, if you can, where you can. Um, and even if you're buying something small, it doesn't have to be like this huge thing. Maybe they have something small that's for a smaller price tag or price or a price point that you can purchase, but it's still supporting that brand. Um, I posted something on our stories also that was talking about the power of social media and, and the power of supporting in that way. Um, I think that, you know, I think that rather than maybe just like not shopping at all, like if you if you are planning to shop or you would like to shop, you have the ability to shop. Um, being more intentional with your purchases, you know, maybe you're not buying, like I said, whatever massive deal this person has going on, this brand has going on, but shopping the brands that you want to see survive because the reality is a lot of them are not surviving and a lot of them are really struggling. And a lot of the brands, I, I really want to say this, like, just because a brand has a really large following on Instagram does not mean that they are reaching their, their profit goals, does not mean that they have a full team. It does not mean that they are doing fine. Um, I think that there's that misconception. I know with SFF, we have a large following and people think that we have a massive team and it's two of us sometimes, mainly me. Sometimes it's two of us, you know? <laughs> so I think it's like important to understand that, you know, social presence also doesn't mean anything. And like, if you have the ability to support these brands, if we talk about sustainability, we talk about we want this to be the future. Like I said, there have to be brands to be able to support. Otherwise we'll end up with these huge mega companies that we mentioned before who are really great at marketing, really great at greenwashing, and they will be the options for us because the smaller brands won't exist. So um, I think that that is potentially a good counter, you know, for Black Friday um, and, and how to spend your money shopping, you know, with uh, people of color brands, women led brands, all of those things are really important. Um, so yeah, so if do you have anything else to add? If not, we have a ton of questions that we can get into uh, from the audience. Do you have anything? Yeah, no, nothing to add. I'm like, I completely agree with you. My husband runs Patricuti now. Mm. And, you know, it's an incredibly tough time, particularly with Panama mm. hats, because lots of people aren't, they aren't traveling, so they're not buying their hats to travel over to overseas mm. as, as well. And the big events where we usually sell a can cancel. So, you know, I, I know from first-hand experience, or, or as he tells me when he comes home every day, it's incredibly tough out there for those, for those small sustainable brands. And it's really, really important to to be supporting them at this time. Totally, yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, in general, I think it's challenging for them because when you are choosing uh, purpose over profit, you know, there are inherently certain decisions and certain things that you have to do differently than, you know, another brand. And so that equals, that's dollar signs right there. Um, so anyway, so let's get into these questions. There's so many of them. Um, let's see, this one says, why do influencers continue so to support high, I think it's supposed to be high fashion brands um, that are on the fashion transparency index. 
<laughs> why? <laughs> so yeah, so I guess why do influencers continue to support brands that are not sustainable? Do you have any thoughts on that? Need a lot of money to do so probably yeah. is, is the sad the sad answer to that. And I think I think things are starting to change because I think people are expecting better of their influencers and that people are looking mm -hmm. for influencers in different places. And a lot of that is due to COVID. You know, we've seen that we've got different we've got different heroes and we can't have people, you know, people aren't going to be they, they don't want their influencers to be talking about some great sustainable outfit that they've just bought in one post and then to be buying from you know a fast fashion brand who doesn't you know isn't talking about the sustainability in the next post so i think there's a real desire for for authenticity and i think influencers are going to have to to almost like go go one way one way or the other but they can't walk some very dubious tight walk in in between the two because people you know pe people are much savvier these days and i think it's it's easier to spot when people are just doing it for the marketing purposes yeah totally um let's see what are the best and most realistic solutions to overconsumption? i think we've i think we've touched on a, a lot of those in terms of the options we've given for black friday I think one thing that's really important to mention here, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a paradox in a way. I was talking to last week to Microfinance Opportunities who interview every, every week they interview garment workers yeah. uh, in also other countries like India and Cambodia. And they say, you know, the message they get from the garment workers is, shop, we want you to shop, we want you to keep buying because we want the overtime. <laughs> and the other, you know, much overtime they want to be paid for that overtime but the message they were sending was you know we want the orders but obviously they need to be paid we want to know that they've been paid for their orders back in april and may and those cancelled orders because mm -hmm. you know, the poverty wages people are getting means that they cannot afford you know even from one month to the next their lives are, are very precarious and they really can't afford to go a month without without wages but the message coming from the workers themselves is we want people to keep on buying because we want jobs. But mm -hmm. having a job in the garment industry, it, it shouldn't preclude having a good job, you know, a job with dignity, a job with fair mm -hmm. wage, a job which doesn't endanger your health because of the, the extreme overtime or the health and safety risks which you're, you're taking. So we have to look at a way of, of kind of com combining the two in a way because working in the garment industry is really valuable for a lot of women in many countries around the world because it does give them a lifeline out of poverty it gives them a route towards independence where otherwise they might be you know married as a teenager and not even be able to go out in the evenings without the permission of their husband's parents so mm. i think we have to recognize the fashion industry as as well as the the huge amount of problems and you know it's it's a it's difficult paradox that we're going to have to work our way through mm. yeah for sure. Yeah, I think it's really interesting too. like, you know, talking about garment workers, a lot of people, a lot of people assume that these atrocities are happening overseas. And certainly they are, but they are also happening right here in the US. Um, like in LA, there's a ton of things. If you follow the garment worker center, they talk all the time about the different, like unbelievable ways that people are being treated. And you're you're thinking like, it's 2020. It's here in the US. It's in LA and they have to bring their own drinking water. Like they, they don't have, like they don't have these basic things. And it's crazy that, you know, it's happening right now. And, and it's amazing that, that it's allowed to continue. So just, just something that yeah, baffles no, my mind. <laughs> yeah, no, same in the UK. We've just, I just gave evidence to an inquiry, the, the Boohoo inquiry. I don't know mm. if you have Boohoo in the States, but a very, you know, on, on, yeah. online big, fast fashion brand the ceo actually lives in the same village as as me oh wow <laughs> it's really, really strange just up up the hill um oh, wow. and it, it is it's really brought up a lot of the issues I and mean, it's made people realize that modern slavery and poverty wages you know illegally low wages less than half of the the the, the minimum wage can occur literally on our doorsteps here in yeah. the midlands so yeah. i i think it's something a lot of people weren't aware of. And I think we really do need to make people realize that, totally. you know, increasingly probably because of COVID, 
brands will look at producing closer to home and we need to make sure that those workers have the same rights and respect and dignity as mm -hmm. the workers who are living overseas as well. Yeah, totally. I see someone asking about our names. Uh, my name is Brittany and, and Carrie. That's <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> oh, I'm Carrie. Um, so I'm, I'm Carrie with a Y, C A W R Y S O N E R S. I just yeah. realized we use ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see. Another question is, what is the responsibility of governments for sustainable and unsustainable fashion? Yep, I mean, I think there's a lot of brands, there's a lot of those laggard brands who aren't going to move unless we have legislation. It's something I really see when we look at the Fashion Transparency Index. A lot of those brands who only score a couple of points, if they are disclosing anything, they tend to be disclosing that in their modern slavery statement, their California transparency and supply chain statement. They will be disclosing the information which is required by, by law. Now in the UK, brands have to disclose their gender pay gap as well mm. by law. There's new, the, the loi de vigilance, the due diligence laws in, in France. So I've really seen how, how that is pushing brands towards more disclosure. And then often within their modern slavery statements, they will be disclosing a little bit more information. Because once they've taken that first rather scary step for them, though goodness knows why it is now, they do then tend to put more and more information in their modern slavery statements in terms of their, their code of conduct, what they're doing to address modern slavery, and maybe some of those 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 processes and procedures and due diligence so incredibly important and i think when it com comes to consumption over consumption we've got the the uh, law in france now which is around the um, extended use of responsibility so that's something mm -hmm. a lot of people in europe will be aware of in terms of electronics that mm -hmm. the people vendors who sell electronics have to be responsible for for the take back of mm -hmm. them Aren't now uh, brands have to disclose what they're doing in terms of the take back of of clothing to make sure that it isn't sent to landfill or incinerated. So that's the kind of legislation we need to see. There's new legislation in Sweden as well around chemicals in our clothing because I mean an astonishing 60% of brands don't publish their uh, restricted substances list. So we have no mm. way of knowing what chemicals are or aren't allowed into our clothing. So I really think we need to see legislation to make brands publish their manufacturing restricted substances list so we can hold them into account for all of those chemicals affecting our bodies, our health, our waterways, our oceans. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that, you know, much like food and, and you know, so many other things are, are regulated, I definitely think that fashion needs to be as well, especially because, you know, we're putting on it on the largest organ of our body, you know, um, and, and I think, you know, a lot of brands and companies don't know, you know, they don't share because they don't know, and they don't take the time to find out because they're busy working on marketing and busy working on new collections and busy working on this and working on that. I think that, I think Aja Barber said it perfectly. We had her um, speak on one of our panels here recently for uh, Fashion Horror Stories. And she was saying that if brands could hold themselves accountable, they would. They would already be doing it. But the fact that they're not shows that they're not able to hold themselves accountable. Therefore, someone else needs to step in and you know hold them accountable because they're not going to do it. We've seen it. Like This conversation you know, it's, it's very popular now and it's very like trendy now to talk about sustainability, but this has been a conversation that's been going on for quite some time. You know, the rights of garment workers and treating them fairly and paying them, you know, a living wage is a conversation that's been happening for quite some time and not a whole lot has changed, you know? So if brands were able to do it themselves, we would see change and unfortunately we're not. So yeah, it does make you think that there is some legislation, there are some, you know, accountability, there are some, there's some things that need to be put in place, because clearly, they're not able to do it themselves. It's like having a big old, like brownie in front of you, like, are you going to take a little piece of that brownie? Or are you going to eat the whole thing? Like, I'm going to eat the whole thing. And apparently, these brands are too. <laughs> um, so let's, let's get another question before we run out of time. Um, how can we get a stronger, how can we get stronger messaging out there to educate shoppers? Yeah, this is something that um, I think about a lot too, like with the sustainable fashion forum, and you might see this also with Fashion Revolution, a lot of the people that are following 
you know, your company or your brand or following what you're doing already sort of know about sustainability. They already have this in their mind. So how can we reach the people who are shopping, you know, some of the biggest offenders right now and don't necessarily know that there are alternatives or know how their choices impact the world and our environment? Yeah, and I guess that's what we really set out to do at the beginning of Fashion Revolution. And back in 2013, we were very innovative in terms of a campaigning organisation because we were the first campaign that really went in using the language of fashion, the visuals of fashion, and we came from the fashion industry. So those mm -hmm. were the people we wanted to reach. We wanted to reach people who loved fashion but didn't know about the rest of of the story and you know it's fantastic to see that there are so many other campaigning organizations now which have have sprung up in you know in recent years and i think it's so important that we all that we all collaborate that we work together because our voices are louder that we're more powerful when we work together i really want to see i mean fashion revolution we set it up as a platform we want organizations like yours and other organizations to use us as a platform so that we can amplify your voices and the voices of all of the other people that, that that you can reach and I think if we do that together that's a really good way to to increase our impact and I think it's it's kind of leading people in and showing them where they can find more information one place I really recommend people to go to is our MOOC we have a massive open online course called Fashion's Future and the Sustainable Development Goals mm. and I know quite a lot of people sort of start the course and I've seen comments saying, oh, well, I just thought I'd take a look and, and I didn't think I'd stick it out. But then I've realised how much information there is here and I'd never realised what an incredible impact we have on whatever issues. And they, they love the course. I think we've had around 30,000 registered learners oh. now. So check that out on Future Learn. It's Fashion's Future and the Sustainable Development Goals. So I think it's just, you know, giving people that, that knowledge, showing them where they can, can, can be equipped with more information to take them further so they can actually go out and, and be activists and, and implement change as, as well. Another thing we're going to be setting up in the next six months is a, a youth ambassador programme as well. Mm -hmm. So we really get some of those you know, really powerful young voices from all around the world and, and let them use that use our platform and hear from them as well so that we can be be better informed about what's happening around the world in different places mm, totally that's awesome that sounds great i'm excited to check that out um okay let's see uh do, 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 do. wow there's so many questions in here okay how do you oh i like this one a lot how do you inspire without shaming? What are some tips for that? So how do we inspire people to make changes in their wardrobe without sort of pointing the finger and wagging our finger at them and shaming them? Yeah, I'm not, I think again, right at the beginning, I remember the very first fashion revolution meeting we had when, you know, after I had this crazy idea in the bathtub and it seemed to... <laughs> All and more and more people wanted to be a part of it. And it was in June 2013 and we got some people together. And the, the words I remember from that first meeting were positive and inclusive. We didn't want to shame people. We didn't want to be shouting in, in the stores with megaphones and tying people to the railings. We wanted to, to educate people. We wanted to show people that the, there were better ways. And we had... Our, our motto then, and as it is now, is be curious, find out, and do something about it. So it's about taking those little steps, about sort of sparking people's curiosity, I think, right at the beginning. And that's why we've used a lot of, of statistics and quotes and some of those you know, really big and meaty reports. How do we then consolidate those down to a few pertinent quotes that make people think, oh, gosh, I never knew how much water it took to, yeah. to, to die for example and then that takes people further and further and we've seen other organizations starting to do that to do that more so it is it's about taking people on that journey I think yeah I think you know at the sustainable fashion forum something that we try to do is we try to incorporate fun into the conversation because you know the impacts of fashion on our and on the world on our environment on communities of people is so heavy and when you think about just 
how detrimental the fashion industry truly is and how detrimental our shopping habits can be, it's really overwhelming and it's really sort of depressing and it's just, it's a lot. Um, and so something that we try to do is we try to share memes. We try to make people laugh while also learning. We try to have real conversations, you know? So, you know, kind of like us talking about Black Friday, like, you know, yes, we're saying if you have the ability, you know, choose differently this Black Friday instead of just over consuming, but also being realistic that some people need this in order to buy the things that are nece a necessity to their life, you know? Or maybe it's not a necessity, maybe it's just something that they really, really want, but like, why should they be excluded from being able to purchase this? Because they can't otherwise, you know, like they, they can't afford it otherwise, right? So I think that I think that a way to share information without sort of wagging your finger at people is to be real, you know, like we are, even though we all believe in sustainability, even though we all want what's best for people and planet, when you see a cute dress that's by a fast fashion company, like, let's not pretend like that's not a cute dress. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to buy the dress, but let's not pretend like it's not cute. You know, like, let's not pretend like we don't understand why people still shop the way that they do and maybe let's come at it from a different perspective and say okay like i totally understand i know that that dress is really cute i know that it would look really good on you but how about we try this over here like how about we try this brand how about we save our money you know and and buy second hand or how you know like trying to give like realistic i think that maybe that's like the the main word that i'm looking for is like being realistic about this you know and, and understanding that people who knew nothing about sustainability yesterday and are just learning about it today are not gonna just snap their fingers and be changed, you know, like change. They're, they're gonna take some time and you have to be patient with them. You have to continue to share that information, continue to share, like think about your own journey into sustainability, right? Like there are lots of people who promote sustainability who also can't afford it also. Like, so think about like your own perspective and how you got into it and what your thoughts were when you first learned about this and how, um, and how you got to where you are now and have compassion for other people and, and allow them to have that journey also. I think, you know, wagging the finger does not get anyone anywhere. <laughs> um, and that's one of the reasons why I actually started the Sustainable Fashion Forum because I, I was an outsider, you know, like I mentioned before, my background is in PR and marketing. I was helping designers, retailers with their marketing, with their brands here in Portland. And like, I knew nothing about sustainability. I found out about it from being a judge at a fashion show that happened to be centered around sustainability. I went home, Googled, and at the time, there was not nearly as much information as there is now on the internet, but I went home and Googled, was completely confused, and then had to like, decided to do an event so I could learn from people who knew more than me, you know? So like, everyone's entry into this conversation is different and just understanding that I think is, is really, really huge. Um, Okay, so maybe just one more question before we before we end. Um, like the there's so much writing, they're like really small, and I'm blind, so I'm like having a hard time reading them. <laughs> um, oh, this is a good one. How do you address the systematic issues of oppression, imperialism, and environmental issues? Oh, there's a part two. Where's the part two? Oh, uh, the fashion in the fashion industry while addressing inaccessibility of more ethical fashion in poor areas. That's a long one. Did you get that? Oh, gosh, that's a long one. I don't know if that's one I can really answer now. What I would say is to uh, if, to tune in in April for Fashion Revolution Week, because we're going to be looking at that. This is the interconnectedness of the social and the environmental. We're going to be looking at the, the historical context of the fashion industry. And I think it's going to be a really interesting Fashion Revolution Week. We're going to be giving much more of the voice to, we, we want to be hearing from those unheard voices, those marginalised voices. Um, I think that's, that's really important. So I'd say keep tuned in, in April, get involved in Fashion Revolution Week, and we'll be addressing that, that much, much more then. I think that's probably too much to start. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye. Everyone. Bye. <laughs>